Greetings, greetings, fellow Who Gazers, and welcome back to Doctor Who Literature, the podcast taking you through the world of the Target novelizations in publication order. My name is Jason. I'm your host on this journey, this very long journey. We have a lot to talk about this week. Last week, I was the number 40 science fiction podcast in the UK. That is terrific. My thanks to everybody who's been listening so far and helping to spread the word about my Little Targets podcast. Speaking of spreading the word, I am very happy to announce that I have joined the Direction Point podcast network. You know me, I love the Crotons. I cannot resist any podcast network that is based upon a line from the Crotons. What this means is that I am now part of a network of several other excellent Doctor Who podcasts, including the Doctor Who Collectors podcast. That's Larry, who runs Direction Point. You will be hearing from him on this show in the near future. His show talks primarily about collecting the books and other Doctor Who merchandise, and he has some excellent, excellent guests on his show. Another member of the Direction Point network is the Doctor Who Target Book Club podcast, which I have been on, and Tony, who runs that, was on one of the first episodes of this show. They talk about the Target books in story order, whereas I am going somewhat as a companion piece to them in publication order. We are talking about, of course, the same books, and there is a little bit of cross-pollination between uh, Tony's show and mine. There are several other podcasts. I would direct you to directionpoint.org if you have not been listening to these podcasts already. And going forward, I will be having bumpers for several of these shows uh, throughout my episodes. So I'm very happy to be associated with Direction Point, and that is the big news that I teased last week. In terms of other projects, Stacy Smith, who runs the Outside In series at ATP Publishing, is working on a volume called Outside and Regenerates. The very first Outside In book came out a decade ago, and it covered every one of the classic series Doctor Who stories, with one essay by a different writer on each story. I was in that volume covering The Time Warrior. Stacy is now revisiting that book, and there's going to be a different essay on every story. I am covering a different story, not The Time Warrior, Stacy is still looking for submissions, and there are many excellent stories out there that are worth discussing. If you have not yet contributed to the Outside In series, please consider throwing a pitch to Stacy. Uh, You can find that information on the ATB Publishing pages on Twitter or on Facebook, so definitely consider giving that a look. In terms of submissions... This is episode 46. That means in four weeks, episode 50, we are going to be covering Doctor Who and the War Games. That is a 10-part TV serial. It is the longest TV episode that we will have been covering on Doctor Who literature to that point. That also as the 50th episode, not counting specials and bonus episodes. That is a nice round number, and it's going to be a little bit of an anniversary week for Doctor Who literature. So for the first time, I will be opening up to submissions. If any of you out there would like to contribute to that episode, either to talk about the Doctor Who literature podcast turning 50 episodes, or about the War Games itself, any aspect of that very long and, in my opinion, very excellent story, I am going to throw it open to you guys. Uh, You can reach out to me, you can send me a clip that is about three minutes long, and the best of those I will put in the show. I already have a guest lined up for that week, and I'm very much looking forward to talking about Doctor Who and the War Games, the novelization. But that will be the first time that I'm going to have an open floor, and any one of you can throw me a brief audio clip for that week. Again, talking about the War Games, or talking about this show, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to come up with. This week, there is a lot. We are talking about The Hand of Fear. That is the novelization, again, of Sarah Jane's, what was supposed to be her final TV story in 1976. Thankfully, it was not, but it's a very emotional tale, and I'll have a lot to say about it. My guest is Dale Smith, who has written lots of Doctor Who, and we also have a guest reading from The Hand of Fear novelization, 
I would point out as well, this is the second straight week on Doctor Who literature that we're talking about a Bob Baker and Dave Martin script, The Bristol Boys, because they had written the Sontaran experiment. We discussed the novelization by Ian Martyr of that last week with Bill Evenson in episode 45. Hand of Fear is novelized by a different writer, Terence Dix, and it is very different in tone from the Sontaran experiment book, so even though it is back-to-back Bristol Boys Week here on Doctor Who Literature, there's going to be a very different tenor of conversation, and I hope you enjoy it. Let's get to it. They all say who, who is Doctor Who? Do you collect Doctor Who? Do you have Doctor Who items and you don't know that you collect Doctor Who? For all things in the Doctor Who collecting world... Tune in to the Doctor Who Collectors Podcast, a Direction Point Network podcast. I am Larry Van Versberg, and your host, and I have been collecting Doctor Who for 41 years. We have popular features like collection protection and the most outrageous offer. Anywhere you get your podcasts. You're listening to Doctor Who Literature, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. You are invited on an adventure across all of time and space in a completely random order. It's the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. Jump in the TARDIS with your hosts, Eric Gulbranson, Asad Cheshke, and Matthew Kressel. Explore Doctor Who TV stories, audio adventures, and books, both novels and non-fiction. The Police Box in the Junkyard podcast. It's the entire Who-niverse. On Shuffle, the Police Box in the Junkyard podcast is a member of the Direction Point Network and is available about once a month wherever you find your podcasts. You are listening to the Doctor Who Literature podcast. Welcome back to Doctor Who Literature. I am very, very pleased today to have a guest who I have been a big fan of for almost 20 years in terms of his own writing. And this person reached out to me to send me fan mail about my show, which was very, very, very pleasing. And he's now agreed to be a guest. And we're going to be talking eventually today about the novelization of The Hand of Fear. But my guest also has a very long writing career and has a fascinating website narrating his entire career as an amateur term pro writer. So I certainly want to talk about that for quite a bit first. Dale Smith, welcome to the program. Hello, thank you for having me. I've sent lots of letters to people saying I like their podcast. You're the first person to actually let me go on them afterwards. So that's very kind of you. Hopefully I will not be the last. Hopefully (laughs) everybody else will follow my lead and put you on, because I know that you're going to have a lot to say. But I want to start off, because this is my show, uh, by talking about (laughs) me first. So how did you discover my show in the first place? Uh, It was a vanity search for the um, Black Archive. So I was looking for things that were talking about talent. And when your talent's episode came up, it made me go, oh, I'll give that a listen. And then you very kindly mentioned me on it. And then from there, I went back to the earlier episodes because I really enjoyed the episode. I thought it was a great discussion with Kate and John. And yeah, I'll not found a dud one yet, so. Yeah, the Kate and John episode is my number one rated episode by an order of magnitude. Nothing else comes close, but hopefully you can beat their record. <laughs> yeah, I imagine if people see that Kate Allman's going to be talking about Tons of Wang Chan, that might get a few people interested. Uh, certainly certainly got me interested. I've, I've known Kate and John for years, so any chance to uh, have a chat with the two of them is always a great experience, but... They just brought their their A game for that one. That was just a phenomenally fun recording. Now the tragedy is I lost the first three minutes because they had a power outage on their end due to a storm, and for whatever reason my recording platform did not save their end of the first three minutes of the conversation. So I had to do sort of a loose cannon style reconstruction before I got to the, the main bulk of the chat. And is that going to get animated by Big Finish? Uh, it is very unlikely to be animated by big finish uh, my face is not the kind of face that translates to animation very easily it's been deemed too horrific for young children <laughs> well we're we're not visual now so it's fine i'm uh, obviously a very young man with a full head of hair <clears throat> and of course we are seeing each other but i will not be putting the video online so our, our our fans will benefit from only having to hear our voices and again i apologize for my voice i cannot do anything about that but it has not scared off too many folks, fortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, this will be <laughs> probably the first episode of the podcast that I won't listen to. Because <laughs> I'll be sitting there going, that guy has got an annoying voice. Oh, my God. The very first time I listened back to um, one of my guest host episodes of Trap One, I really wanted to punch myself in the face. But that taught me a lot about how to dial down my, my interview questions. So hopefully I've learned my lesson. <laughs> I first discovered you, I was always a year or two behind on the PDAs, the Past Doctor Adventures, because at that point, I, I, had, I had started my career and I just didn't have the time for reading that I used to have when I was a starving law student or young unemployed lawyer. And the books at that point were harder and harder to come by in the States, and it might be several months before a book came across I think the way that I got heritage is that my future sister-in-law made a trip to London with her college friends, and I sent her there with a shopping list, and she came back with three or four EDAs and PDAs for me. So I think that's how I got heritage. And I read it with just delight. And of course, at that point, I did not know that it was modeled heavily after a Western movie that I hadn't seen at the time, and that would have appreciated, it would have enhanced my enjoyment even more had I caught that. Uh, so this is where I'll talk about me again. I wrote a review for the ratings guide, uh, Stacy Smith, then known professionally as Robert Smith. And this is, you know, 19 years ago. So I was a lot more sophomoric than I like to think that I am now. And not only did I write a review of Heritage, but I wrote a review that basically reflected everything that I was binge watching on television at the time. So the toner of the review at times comes across more as a journey through my head at age 29 or 30 than it does a review of your of your excellent book. So reading my review back for the first time in many years, I'm like, this is a really good book. I wish you would talk about it more. Now, the kicker is on your website, which we'll talk about in a moment, you post all the reviews of all, of all your novels, including the bad ones. Uh, you pointed my attention to a thermonuclear scorching review of your book that somebody used to try and sell a copy on eBay. So I'm like, who can have a bad word to say about this this book, Heritage? So I went to your review, and it's mine. <laughs> Somebody, and I honestly do not know who this is because I don't have uh, an eBay seller account. I don't know who this could be. Somebody took my review, chopped out every single compliment that left out only the sarcastic or negative stuff, and that's about four or five paragraphs, and posted it on eBay as a description to try and sell the book. Who on earth would do that? And I apologize for having written something that could be <laughs> repurposed to such an evil intent. I really should resubmit a new proper review of Heritage to the ratings guy. So I apologize on my behalf for that one. But that has to be a surreal experience for you as well. Uh, that one, bad reviews can hurt but that one was just so amusing because it was somebody trying to sell the book and you think they might say hey this is good you might want to own this but no they just couldn't hold it back long enough but i i hadn't noticed i had seen your review and i'd seen this review and i hadn't noticed that they had the same bits in them so they actually sat down edited it so that it made it look worse and put it up there and went hey who wants to buy this book <laughs> There was there, there there was my obligatory one paragraph pointing out stuff that I that I didn't like in the book, and then everything else, all my TV binge watching observations that were totally unrelated to your book, uh, were left in. So it's a bizarre work of nonfiction, and I, <laughs> I apologize again, and I'm glad that it didn't scare you off <laughs> coming on the show. So your idea for Heritage is a fascinating idea. You decided to take a great movie. And you decided to take the plot beats and turn it into a Doctor Who novel. And it's just a, a brilliant idea. And I'm not really a, a fiction writer as such, but it must have been a lot of fun for you taking this movie, which is not the most famous of American Westerns, and spinning it into a Doctor Who story set on an alien planet with a character named Haydoke. <laughs> well, I, I believe that was his introduction to uh, the Doctor Who uh, the public world at that, at that point. This is before all of the uh, DVDs came out. Yeah, that was the most visual that uh, Toby had been. We were both at university together, so he's a friend of a friend. And 
he's now eclipsed me in Doctor Who, so I'm very annoyed with him. But uh, yeah, that was that was me doing him a favor and going, look, now you're in Doctor Who. So what made you choose Bad Day at Black Rock as the basis for your first published Doctor Who novel, as opposed to, say, True Grit or The Searchers or High Noon or any other number of arguably more widely known Westerns? So Bad Day at Black Rock is my favorite Western in the whole world. It was uh, on one of our local TV stations when I was about 10. And I watched it and fell in love with it because my dad was a fan of westerns. He used to, uh, my dad was deaf and he used to watch True Grit at least once a week. And he would keep us awake at night because he would start watching it at 10 o'clock with the volume turned up so he could hear it. And we would be lying in bed for school the next day going, oh, it's that bit where she gets bit by the snake. And so ever, ever since him loving westerns, I've inherited that. But finding this one it is if you haven't seen it go and see it people listening it is a very very good film it's uh, spencer tracy in the main lead but the the reason it became a doctor who story was sort of twofold at the time my main weakness i saw as me as a writer was structure and plot so i i would tend to splurge stuff onto the page and then get to the end panic that I hadn't said everything and throw it all in to the last chapter and I thought an easy way to fix that would be to find another story and take the plot beats from it and use that as my structure and then build around that with Bad Day at Black Rock it is so blatantly a seventh doctor story that it's unbelievable. It is about a lone guy who comes into town, finds something is going wrong, and over the course of one night makes the whole thing better, finds the bad guys and punishes them. And it just looked like a Seventh Doctor story to me at that point. And uh, it was, when I was originally planning it, it was a solo Doctor story set after the end of the new adventures and before the tv movie so he was going to be in his tv movie costume and i had no idea that it was actually going to get published it was i was writing fan fiction at the time which i was putting on uh not rack arts doctor who i can't remember the fan fiction version of that but it was that jade one. pagoda i think could well be yeah but uh it was going to be the next chapter of a story I was doing there. And then I managed to sell a couple of short stories to Doctor Who magazine. And that just made me go, oh, maybe people might actually publish it. So I did the synopsis and sent it off to the BBC. And they came back and said, everybody in the world is pitching a solo seventh Doctor story set before the TV movie. <laughs> Could you possibly work Ace into it? And instead of going, oh, my God, they didn't like it. Damn it. I went, oh, they want me to try again. So I did. Now, looking at the cast list, uh, this is a who's who of great American character actors, because you don't just have Spencer Tracy. You also have Walter Brennan, who was in everything made between, I think the 1920s and the 1960s, and was actually one of the voices that Robin Williams parodied in the uh, original animated version of Aladdin, which is a bit of a deep cut for the few remaining Walter Brennan fans. And I put myself in that category but you also have Ernest Borgnine, you have Lee Marvin, you have Anne Francis, who was later in one of the most creepy Twilight Zone episodes ever. Were you consciously mirroring your guest cast in the book on the movie's guest cast? And who would Ace uh, slot into if you, if you were to fit her into the, the movie story at all? I, I think having to fit Ace in was what turned it from being me just copying this movie and it becoming an actual book of its own because I had 
the story of the film all laid out with the Doctor doing what he needed to do at every point for it to all work out. And then they asked Rose to go in and so I sort of wound her over the top of it. So in my head, she was never in the film. But I do have a, a, a sheriff character who's based on the sheriff character in the film. The main bad guy is, if I'm remembering correctly, that was Lee Marvin, wasn't it? And he very much <laughs> was the basis of the main bad guy in the, in the story, the main henchman. And there is nobody from the film who corresponds to the psychopathic dolphin, unfortunately. <laughs> and I'm not going to spoil the, the main revelation of the book, which I was delighted by. It features heavily in my rather sophomoric review from 20 years ago, which I am still apologizing for. But basically, <clears throat> Bad Day at Black Rock is about uh, a, a murder or two that had been committed in the town um, for the worst possible motives in the wake of <clears throat> World War II and some socio-political grievances. I'm putting that as vaguely as I can. In the book, you have a <clears throat> beloved former companion of the doctor who essentially has uh, has died and has left a legacy behind on on, on dust. And I'm not going to say who it was that died before the book started, but it's someone who is rumored to be returning in the centenary special, although everybody's rumored to be <laughs> returning. But as we sit here doing this recording, it's someone whose name just popped up a couple of days ago, and I dearly hope to see them again, which would have the effect of possibly making Heritage non-canonical. But how did you come up with the idea to use this character as the, as the moral centerpiece of, of your novel? Or was that something that was imposed on you by the by the editors? No, it was it was my idea for the book. The the thing I did just before I did the proposal for Heritage was a article which I posted on Records Doctor Who saying how you should get published by BBC Books. And it was basically a long-winded way of saying, follow the guidelines and then follow the guidelines and then follow the guidelines. And the first thing I did when I did my first proposal to them was break their main guideline because they had in very big letters at the end of their writer's documents, do not kill any past companions because it was getting to a point where there weren't that many left to be killed off. Mm. But the, the reason Mal was in the story was because at the time Bonnie Langford was in the newspapers again for some reason. I can't remember what it was, but she was being interviewed in something and she was talking about her time on Doctor, Doctor Who and the way people reacted to her on Doctor Who. And she wasn't greeted with open arms, I think, at the time. <laughs> but she was given a character that had interesting things about her that was never developed and also it was at the point that doctor who was probably at its lowest so she didn't get a lot of opportunity on it to do things and at the time she was talking about the work she was doing with big finish and how that was giving people a chance to see the kind of thing she could do and it it did make me think that there was a lot of potential there for the character and also, it would be vaguely amusing to kill somebody that people might be happy to see get killed, but do it in a way that hopefully would make them sad that it had happened. And I realise in saying that I have completely ruined your, let's not spoil this 20-year-old story. <laughs> Bonnie Langford played many people in Doctor Who, and one of them was in my story. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good way of narrowing it down yeah there was this plot line going on which dated back to the new adventures where every time an old companion would come back their lives had been ruined by the doctor and they they were either dead or destitute or repudiated the doctor in a forceful way and especially the last of the 1996-1997 new adventures it was happening in almost every book 
So Justin Richards, uh, being incredibly clever, actually worked this into the last ongoing story arc of the Eighth Doctor Adventures. Then he resolved it and reset it and made it right. I think in some time never was 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 the book, which ended the main EDA story arc. So I guess perhaps uh, Bonnie Langford's character's death could be retconned by some time never, which would set up her possible appearance in the centenary special, which has been teased but not yet confirmed. So mm-hmm. maybe there's a way to put Heritage and the Jodie Whittaker universe on the same page. Well, at, at the time I was writing it, I was. I was thinking about the fact that once you kill a companion in a story, that can easily get undone, and that would then weaken the rest of the story. So I never actually made anyone certain that she was dead. So I, I put her, I put it at the end of her life. So she'd gone through the menopause. So she was forties upwards. And I also made sure to give the doctor a line to Ace where he said, if I see you dead, then you are dead and that's it. And there's nothing I can do about it. And the implication is that he hasn't seen Mel dead. So she could well still be kicking around. But yeah, sometime never has already made all of that superfluous. So. And your book also tied into the Tucker and Perry series of Seventh Doctor PDAs, which, again, spoilers for 20-year-old books. At this point in the... I think you were the only non-Tucker Perry writer whose book was explicitly worked into the Tucker Perry season 27 quote-unquote continuity. So at this point in the line, the Doctor already has possession of... Ace's corpse, and in the next Seventh Doctor PDA, Loving the Alien, he does a rather gruesome autopsy of Ace's corpse, and then figures out how she died, and then manages to retcon that uh, in a rather interesting way, which I won't get into here. So, Heritage as a book serves a lot of purposes. And then you reminded me, you also wrote the new series Adventures, uh, I believe, The Tenth Doctor and Martha, in a book that I had read many years ago, and I reviewed for Enlightenment, which is the Toronto Doctor Who Information Network fanzine, which at the time was being run by by Graham Burke. So I know that I read Many Hands, and I know that I reviewed it, but I cannot find the review anymore. I wrote it as a Word document, I guess, 14 or 15 years ago, and cannot find the file anymore. And I gave most of my NSAs away for charity at a convention a few years ago. So. I've read the summary of Many Hands, and I know that I've read it, and I know that I've reviewed it, and I must have enjoyed it if I wrote the review for it, because I I tried not to be negative for enlightenment. There's certainly enough of that going around fanzines. But I no longer have a copy or my review, so my memory is frustratingly vague on this. So uh, briefly, how did Many Hands come to be, and what was your primary storytelling motivation there? And I guess, was that based on a movie as well? So at the... At the time, it I thought I was pretty much done with Doctor Who. They um, back in the days of the EDAs and the PDAs, anybody could write for them. You could send in a submission, and BBC Books would look at it and respond to it, which was one of the most amazing things in the world. But they could do that because at that point, Doctor Who was a dead series, and the BBC didn't mind if books got published that did weird things with it as lawrence miles will gratefully attest but (laughs) then when it came back the books became quite a serious and important thing for the bbc and the the way they did them was strictly by commission they got in touch with writers that they wanted to, to do them and I was fairly certain I would not be on anyone's list because I'd only done the one past Doctor Adventure and it got very good reviews and it got very bad reviews because it was a little bit off field, I think. But uh, one day, for reasons I have no idea about, I got an email from Justin Richards saying, would you like to write a book for us? And I said, yes, yes, please. Yes, I would. Yes. 
but uh, what he wanted was a a few pitches because they once they picked the writer, they were definitely going to publish something by that writer. But all of the stories had to be run past the production team, and at the time it was Gary Russell doing the vetting, so they needed a number of ideas that they could pick one out of and say that's fine you can go off and do that it won't ruin anything on the tv i did have one idea turned down because it had a character in it from history that they were planning to do something with i don't think they ever actually turned up on screen but that was the the kind of thing so i came up with about five pitches and one of them was for the hand of fear meets zombies in Edinburgh. That is that is definitely ringing a bell now. Yes, <laughs> and that was the that was the one they went for. And at that point, I went, "Oh, I've got to actually come up with a story for this." Oh no! <laughs> but yeah, the uh, one of the other ones that I pitched at the time was H.G. Wells versus the Pilgrim Men, which in the true finish uh, history of Big Finish became a Big Finish story for them. So. <laughs> Now you have a website which I have just totally fallen down the rabbit hole, dalesmithonline.com, which is an incredibly helpful soup to nuts, uh, nuts to bolts, A to Z, or as we would say here in the States, A to Z guide on how to become a professional writer. And you have it broken down into five basic tabs, and then you have links to all of your work in the five tabs and you have talked on that website a lot about the stuff that we're going over today. And it would be very easy to just stop the recording and say, read the entirety of the website. And that could tell you a lot more than any hour long podcast could. And I'm desperately trying to not cover the same ground over again, but I want to point out some interesting coincidences. You have an unpublished article on there that was supposed to be in Graham Burke and then Robert Smith's, Time Unincorporated Volume 4. I also had a commissioned accepted piece that was supposed to be in Time Unincorporated Volume 4, and that ended up never finding a publisher. I had done a piece on the, this will sound totally out of left field for anybody who follows this podcast, it was a look by me at the literary merits of the target novelizations. I know, hold on to your hat, where did that come from? And I submitted a draft, assuming that because I was friends with Robert and uh, I guess I'll say Stacy and Graham, I assumed I would get commissioned no matter what. But they sent me back notes on what I did wrong. So I did a long rewrite of the piece, and they accepted it. And then, of course, the book never came to pass. And you also had uh, an essay that should have been in Time Unincorporated Volume 4, and you've published the essay on your website, and it talks about your history with online Doctor Who fandom in the 1990s. And I believe your piece is called The Web of Fear, if memory serves me right. It is, yeah. I can't imagine where that title came from. (laughs) And I think you and I just managed to miss each other because my heyday on Rec Arts Doctor Who, where I posted far too much and far too frivolously, was 1992 to 1998 when when I graduated law school and dialed back my online presence. And you were on Rec Arts and Jade Pagoda, I think a little bit after my time. I was a lurker on Jade Pagoda for a while because my fiction writing dreams died hard, but I don't recall us ever interacting in the 1990s, although it's more than possible that we did at some point and I've forgotten about it. Yeah, I've been trying to work out whether we did coincide there or not. I, I think you're right. I don't think we interacted. But I would have been Paul on there as well. So uh, Dale is my middle name, named after Dale Arden. And I use it for writing because there are quite a few Paul Smiths in the world, one of whom is already writing Doctor Who books. And (laughs) right, I'll use my middle name, Dale Smith. That's fine. No one will use that. And it turns out there's an American poet who's got the same name as well. So I can't get mistaken for them instead. I'm in a similar boat in that my first and last name, my first, I'll say that again, my first and last name combination is incredibly common. And there was a famous actor slash playwright with the exact same 
first and last name as myself. So when that person passed away, I had their New York Times obituary, which took up several columns, posted on my office door. This is about <laughs> 20 years ago. Uh, my middle name is much more unique, and I hate it, and I, I try to use it as rarely as possible. But because of the way my college university account was created my middle name was stuck up there on screen and i didn't know how to take it off and my middle name was spun into a character in a kate and john eighth doctor adventure from the mid to late 1990s so my middle name has been given a sort of immortality in doctor who fiction and i, I choose that word with precision <laughs> so like you i also go by uh, different names which have been used for different purposes online both good and ill you have a very long passage on uh, your website and that's dalesmithonline.com about the making of your black archive and that's this the black archive number 58 talons of wang chiang now talons was a story that i always loved unreservedly because it just never occurred to me as a tween or a teen that the as you call it rightfully, racist material was problematic. It took me a long time to come to that realization. I've had a few different guests talk about talents on this show recently. I had Kate Orman on this show, and she had written the piece for Tardis Eruditorum, which you quote from liberally in your Black Archive. And then I had Graham Burke on. I, I'm not a DWM subscriber anymore, so I didn't know about this at the time. But in 2018, DWM's time team watched talents and said this is awful this is racist garbage and one of the editorial figures at dwm had to jump in with an editorial defending the story as being quote unquote of its time and when graham burke was on here discussing a different book and we circled back to talk about talents he made the very funny analogy to a season one family guy clip where meg turns up the thermostat by one degree to make it warmer and every dad in the neighborhood comes out to tell her that she can't do that. She has to keep the thermostat low. So that was Graham's comparison to how the older generation of fandom is so reflexively defensive uh, of talents. So that's my long-winded intro. Tell us from your side, how did you come to realize that talents is incredibly problematic? How did you approach the Black Archives, and what was the writing and editing process like for your volume, which I have here. I've read it. It's phenomenal. This is probably the third or fourth time that I've mentioned it on the show, so if you're listening, please pick it up. <laughs> but, Dale, how did this come to be for you? So the, the main starting point was that controversy from Doctor Who magazine where the thing that kept getting brought up again and again was that the uh, black and white minstrel show was still being shown on the BBC at the same time that Talons was on and so that meant the 70s just weren't aware of all this stuff and the one thing I knew at the time was that uh, Lenny Henry had been on the black and white musicals stage shows and had found it deeply problematic. The um, people listening to this probably already know, but the Black and White Minstrel Show was a show where people in blackface sang minstrel songs for entertainment for the British public. And it is deeply disturbing that that was something we used to watch. But there you go. Um, so every time somebody said the 70s didn't know about racism, it just got my eye going and I knew there were things that could be said to counter that and that was the main thing I wanted to do. That was what the original pitch to Philip Persa Hallard, the then only editor of the Black Archives, was and that was why he quite rightly said you can't write a Black Archive just about the racism on talents. There is more to it than that go away and when it all simmers down maybe we'll have another look at something and it was a year later that I did start to think there were other things that you could say about it that I 
sat down and jotted some of them down on a on a piece of paper and thought what each chapter would be and it was still the intention that it would be going through a process of building to to a conclusion that it's racism is not something that needs to be explained away it is something that needs to be discussed and acknowledged and where we go from there isn't my place to say but as part of that there are a few details you can go through its production history was very interesting it was one of the ones that was done at the last minute it was the last story that philip hinchcliffe ever did and you can kind of tell that he went right well i'm i'm just going to go for it because i'm not going to be here next week and robert holmes is still the best writer doctor who has ever had my personal preference might veer towards stephen moffat a bit but i don't think there are any any stories since robert holmes stopped writing them that have hit the way that his work does and the way he the way he constructs stuff the way he writes character even though he's so lauded he doesn't always get the the plaudits for the way he actually sat down and did it people talk about him being amazing at double acts and that sort of steers you away from seeing just how good a character he is and it's just his way of expressing that character is through dialogue and you can only really do dialogue with people talking to each other so you have the black archive divided up into five chapters and again i am coming from the u.s i am coming from a different cultural and historical background so as i read the black archives and i put lewis baston's black archive on the Sunmakers on the same level as this one you are talking about british colonial history and the East India Company, and some of the horrific bits of cultural subjugation that was being carried out under the crown in the 19th century. This is stuff that I was only dimly aware of and did not know the details. <clears throat> you mentioned that Professor Lightfoot early on in Talons talks about his father was part of the punitive expedition. Then you explain what that was and why this whole anecdote by Lightfoot is, by Lightfoot is incredibly suspect and how he came quote unquote into the possession of Greel's time cabinet so you have five chapters here you have foe from the future which talks about the production history and how this was a last minute replacement story for a different robert banks stewart script which has since been spun into a big finish of its own you have the talons of victoria which i found very enlightening uh, talking about what the british empire was doing the time traveler and his savage companion. And you talk quite a bit about the Fu Manchu stereotypes and how this both is and is not the Fu Manchu story. And there's a really interesting point there. We'll come back to this about how the double act of Greel and Li San Chang mirrors the double act of the doctor and Leela. Now I've been, a Doctor Who fan for nearly 40 years, and I had never clued into that. So <clears throat> that made my hair stand up. And as you can see, I'm recording this early morning U.S. time. My hair is still <laughs> evidently <laughs> standing up in shock. Uh, you have Die Bent Face, which I also did not consider about uh, the issue of facial disability and how characters with uh, facial scars or deformities are treated in Doctor Who. And then your last chapter of It's Time and Ours is an incredibly raw uh, bit of personal writing, which is not often seen in the black archives that I've been able to collect. But here I am, of course, explaining your book to you. So can you walk us through some of these chapters and issues from your perspective rather than mine? Yeah, so, I mean, the the last chapter is probably the, the beating heart of the book, and it is where most of the the difficult stuff is but I, th I, I think I wouldn't say that the people definitely knew they were making a racist story I, I would more say 
they had cultural blinkers on that stopped them thinking wider and seeing that it was problematic. And I think they, so the, the key point I make in it is that at this point, that doesn't really matter for the story then. What matters is that story still exists and is still part of our culture. It is a bedrock of Doctor Who history and the way we engage with it now has to acknowledge that that stuff is there and be open to the idea that people people won't like it because of that and their experience of that story will be completely different from a Doctor Who fan who has grown up with it and loves it and they're allowed to express that and talk about what needs to happen now for that to stop happening to them because it's it's not like towns got made in the 70s and then it all got better all of the stuff that happened then is still going on now it's just there has been some progress the the representation in doctor who now is better but it's still not perfect there are there are bits of modern who that i pick up in that last chapter and say you know it's similar things are happening here it's just less visible like the um the, the ghost of the punjab i can't remember the actual title but the uh the partition story is a wonderful story and it is something that you could only tell in doctor who and it is something that has never been talked about on british tv in that way Ever. It is a wonderful story, but it is also the first story that an Asian writer wrote for the series. And you can see that somebody somewhere went, it's okay for this story to get told because it's an Asian person doing it. And that's the kind of story an Asian writer can do. And it would be nice if we had a situation where writers who weren't the default white got to write the full range of what Doctor Who can be. I want to jump in on that point because I have been at the final stages of my Doctor Who pilgrimage on Twitter. So I just watched Demons of the Punjab a couple of weeks ago, and I just reached Ascension of the Cybermen last night. And tonight is the moment that I've been dreading, having to watch the Timeless Children again. So... By the time this drops, I will. I should have already reviewed Timeless Children on, on Twitter. So come take a look and see what I thought of it the second time around. But Vinay Patel did come back the following season to write Fugitive of the Janoon, which is a story without any uh, racial or historic elements. So that's a better example of a writer being allowed to tell any story and not just a specific story about their own background. But something else that I talked about last week with regard to Rosa, and then I saw Charlene James's Can You Hear Me a couple of nights ago, <clears throat> the first two times you have a black woman allowed to write a Doctor Who script that makes it to air, the showrunner gives himself co-writer credit both times. And the line that I used last week about Rosa is, a script that's by a black woman about a black woman. Gee, what this story really needs is a middle-aged white guy putting his name on the script. And then the exact same thing happens with Can You Hear Me, which starts off by telling a story about a young woman in Aleppo in 1380 and could be the most interesting story in the world and goes off in a completely different direction where that character is almost sidelined for, for, for the middle three acts. So that's probably a better example of why Chibnall's name is on the script because there's not too much left of the original writer's proposal. But you have the writer of Talons is also the script editor of Talons. So the script editor, the person who could have arguably put a stop to this, wasn't because he was also the writer. And there was nobody to say, you really shouldn't be telling this kind of story in, in this day and age. Robert Holmes could have used a script editor on the story. And of course, he was script editing himself and has these cultural blinkers on. It is perfectly possible to watch the story and enjoy it for what it is. 
and still worry about the way that it does some of it. I, the Fu Manchu, Fu Manchu trope itself is it it was designed as a racist attack against immigrants so it is very hard to do any story that uses that without it bringing all of that history to it i think what a lot of people say in defense of the story is that it does have moments where characters say things that you can read if you want to as being a repudiation of the racism in it. I don't think that's true. Certainly the doctor in it gets a lot of lines that if you look at them on paper look like he's saying, ha ha ha, you're a racist and I'm not. But most of the time they are delivered as if he is agreeing with the fact. And I I think that is just a function of the way that Robert Holmes wrote stories. He he took the whole milieu of other stories and put the Doctor into them as a as a character. So the rules of that story's universe were set, and in the Fu Manchu universe, the Chinese are dubious and should not be trusted and are going to get you and so the doctor is aware that those are the rules of the universe he is in and so he acts in accordance with that which is where the problem comes in because the doctor is the one character you have who can look at what is going on around him and go this is not right they i think people get caught up a lot on the yellow face which is used in it and think that if you could somehow go back and do a CGI version of it where you've got a Chinese actor to play Chang, that would fix everything. And that is definitely not the case. I, I, it is such a difficult, a difficult part of our history. It's, I, I think it needs to be there and it needs to be what it was and it needs to be looked at as it is. I think there is nothing wrong with you liking that story. It is still up there in my top 10 of Doctor Who stories, and I've written a book about how bad it is. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think the desire to go back and fix it in some ways is part of the problem because it it comes from an idea that there's there's something in there that happened accidentally doesn't represent anything about society then and society now. And that if you could just go back and tweak this and tweak that, suddenly racism would be fixed and we could all go back to pretending it doesn't exist anymore. So in that way, Talons is probably the most relevant story today because it makes all of that stuff so obvious to modernize and yet was so invisible to the people making it. And what what you need to use it as is a tool to go, what can I not see now? Rather than going, ha ha ha, look at them, they can see that and it's obvious. You also, not just talking about the racism of the story, there was this fascinating chapter about Magnus Greel's facial deformity and how that is problematic in and of itself. And that was, I'll admit, an aspect that I had not considered. And facial deformity is a widely used trope, especially throughout the classic series of Doctor Who. We already talked about Caves of Androzani. How did you arrive at this chapter? And do you think that the Chibnall era is trying to do a much better representation of characters with impairments i uh the i sorry the short version is i used to work at a, a place that worked with beck which is an actors union and they 
do lots of things, including campaigning. And while I was working with them, they were launching the Changing Faces campaign, which was them trying to get people who make TV and film to realize the problem of the representation of facial disagreement, which I remember is not the correct term and everyone makes mistakes. So if anyone is bothered by that, I apologize. Um, the Basically, it gets used as an easy way of marking out villainy. And that is something that, like the other problems in Talons, has just sort of come through history without anyone properly looking at it. And it causes a lot of problems for the people who have those problems in real life, because there is documented studies that show it has an effect on how people treat them. And it's, it's such a, such a hackneyed old trick because we've been doing it so long. It's not something that we need to, to keep alive and we can just easily stop doing and get rid of. The campaign itself had a lot of success in some ways. Certainly Doctor Who in recent years doesn't use that trope in the same way and hasn't since it came back as well. It's There are examples of people with strange faces but it's not always used in the same dramatic look at this it's scary way that it used to be but it's also not a hundred percent success there's still characters you can think of in recent films where they're the villain and they have a, a facial disfigurement like Blofeld in the when he came back in the James Bond films and I won't say which one just in case it's a spoiler <laughs> but yeah the the modern the modern series has been better at it chibnall has been the best at it so far i think whatever else you think about the chibnall era of the show he has definitely thought about it thought about who his audience is and thought about what he wants to represent as being humanity and he's been brilliant at just widening the net on who he will cast to play characters that don't have to have a specific background or disability or impairment and it's it's a good start it, there could be more but there could always be more and he should definitely be celebrated for what he has done so far on it. Let's talk then about the hand of fear, which is nominally the book of the week. And I thank my audience for listening to this fascinating conversation, which is not directly related to this week's show topic. How early on in your Doctor Who, and we have identical copies to hold up, the Roy Knipe cover is just a thing of beauty here, even though it's a, taken from a reference photo from the Planet of Evil. How did you first discover Hand of Fear? So I started watching Doctor Who so young that I don't actually remember doing it, but uh, it was something that my father watched and decided to introduce me to. So I started watching with him. It must have been towards the end of the, the Baker era and the start of the Davison era. There are snatches that I remember, but it was probably Sylvester McCoy that properly cemented me in as a, as a fan, and that's the era I remember. But in terms of the books, they were... They were right there at the start of it because there was this program that I watched with my dad. And then I went into school and we had some books on a shelf there that we could read if we finished doing the work. And one of them was The Power of Kroll. And I started reading that in school and devoured it and loved it. 
And then there was a, a department store in Leicester where I grew up called Fenix. And I was out shopping with my mother and we went down the stairs into the basement where they had just a, the tiniest book selection in the world. And in there, there was the Curse of Peladon and Fury from the Deep, I think. And I was just amazed that there were more of these books and I could buy them. And it was, it was a, an odd time because because I'd just watched it with my dad. I was the only person I knew who liked Doctor Who. I wasn't aware there was a fandom out there for me to even think about joining. So all I knew about Doctor Who was what I worked out for myself from watching it. So I read those first books and there was Peter Davison in them. And that was fine. I, uh, the, the front page of the book where they say, based on the television series by some of the books where they changed the title of the book, they would write in the name of the story. But in some of the early ones, if they hadn't changed the title, they would just say based on the television series and say who wrote it. And I took that to mean the ones where it said a story name were based on TV episodes that I hadn't seen in the past. But the ones that didn't say a story name were completely original Doctor Who stories. And it, it wasn't until uh, Doctor Who Celebration came out and I got that from my local library that I saw this list of stories and went, oh, hang on a minute, I've got that one and that one. And I didn't realize they were TV stories. And then I sat down with that book and just by hand copied out the name of every story and then crossed off the ones that I got in Target Books and then looked at the long list of ones that I didn't have and went, right, I'm going to get them because they were, they were the only way I was ever going to find out what happened in those stories. And that was, that was what I wanted. So as time went on and the videos started coming out, I would still get the target books. But if it was a target book of a story that I had seen on video, they didn't always get read. So I've got a full collection of target books over there but there are still a few of them that i have not read and listening to your podcast has made me go oh yeah i'm gonna go back and do all of them in the right order and see what happens talking about the hand of fear as a book after the break i'm going to be doing my what cult box described as my forensic look at the text of the book and I'll be breaking down. There's quite a bit of changes between the TV production of the hand of fear and the Terrence novelization, primarily because he was working from a slightly older draft of the script that did not include a lot of Tom and Liz's input developed in rehearsal or ad libs. But I'm going to talk quite a bit about how I love the writing of this book and the sarcasm that Terence drops in when he's not crazy about a particular bit of plotting, and also his remarkable descriptive powers with, with simile. People think that Terence was just doing raw transcripts of the camera script and wasn't adding anything of value, which could not be further from the truth. That's almost the whole purpose of this podcast to begin with. There's just a lot that Terence does that is so good and so stealth that you hardly notice it's there. I will be discussing all that um, over the rest of this program. But from your perspective as a writer and you, your website, Dale Smith Online, you talk quite a bit about how you become a writer, fanfic, how you get noticed, how you get published. Looking at the novelization of The Hand of Fear, which presumably you read at a, at a much younger age, can you see in this book – the elements that made you want to be a writer in the first place or failing that what about Terence Dix's writing remains readable and relevant today I think Terence Dix like a lot of people of my generation is the reason why I'm a writer and it probably wasn't until I started to go back and look at these novelizations again i realized 
just how much he's there in my writing. He is he's very much a writer of TV coming to write prose. So the way he writes a scene in a book is as an omniscient narrator most of the time. He looks in at the action of the story and describes to you what you need to know to understand what's going on. Sometimes that means going into a character's head and telling you what they're thinking, but not not as often as other books. He's definitely not Proust, where he's writing the whole thing from the inside of a character's mind. Mm. And he's so good at it. <laughs> he's, he picks just the right thing to look at, Sometimes that's something that was on the TV story, but even there, he's still directing your focus at the relevant bit of the screen. And sometimes it's stuff that he's just made up completely for the story so that he can get you to understand that story and believe in it. There's a there's a bit in the book where the uh, the director of the nuclear plant is thinking that his nuclear plant is going to explode and he gets the opportunity to ring his wife and his child and his child picks up the phone and he has a moment where he gets annoyed at the kid for just babbling at him and that moment is just so real and human that you go you know what you're doing i believe that moment because kids are annoying and he <laughs> even <laughs> In that situation, you would have that flash of going, I wanted to say goodbye to you all, but oh my God, will you shut up? <laughs> uh, Terrence hitting upon a, uh, a universal truth there. Uh, for you, what is the definitive Terrence Dix novelization? Which is the one that you would say, this is your how-to guide on how to be a writer, this one book right here. Which one do you think is his, his pinnacle, so to speak? He's done so much stuff the the target books that he did led me to his other books as well uh, particularly the Baker Street Irregular books that he did and they were just perfect examples of writing for children it was obviously something he he loved doing and an idea that he'd wanted to work on for ages because you could just tell in the way he wrote them he was loving every moment of it. I think it's really hard to just pull out any one. The ones that you like the most as a fan from this end of fandom are the ones where he veers off and does something different and changes something or gives you an alternative perspective that you don't get from watching the TV series which is weird because from the other end of fandom, these books were meant to be the definitive only way you would know what happened in these stories. And when they veered away from that, you got annoyed at them. Mm. So now nearly everything is available to us to actually watch. It is the ones where he's done something new and different with it that I treasure the most, I think. Well, Dale, because you are not just a writer and an expert on Doctor Who fiction, but you are also a fan of the show, I am going to subject you to a game of 20 questions, which is one of the most fiendish and dastardly plans that I can inflict upon my guests. You know the drill. I have used the randomizer.net, and I have selected one Doctor Who story between 1963 and and 2022 your job with 20 yes or no questions is to guess which story i have randomly selected the record is six conrad was able to guess his last time and six the negative record uh, the worst showing so far was 19 nobody has failed the game yet and i doubt you are going to be the first uh, some people will try and guess a random story with question number one to see if they can get it in one. Other folks have methodical approaches. Other folks have whimsical approaches. And I'm curious to see how you are going to tackle the enigma of 20 questions. 
I'm very tempted to do it like it's the pyramids of Mars and ask you what you would ask. <laughs> I'm not sure that would work as well in this situation. Right. That's, I'm also very tempted just to say, is it Remembrance of the Daleks as the first one? Because imagine if it was, that would be fantastic. But I think I will say, was it produced by John Nathan Turner? Yes. Question number one is a hit, a palpable hit. It was produced by John Nathan Turner, which only narrows you down to a mere 10 years of the program. <laughs> good luck, sir. <laughs> I mean, I could say, was it good? And that would narrow it down a lot as well. Uh, yeah, let's... That's a very subjective statement there, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> was it uh, script edited by Eric Sowett? Yes, that's a second hit. You're two for two. It was script edited by Eric Sayward, which doesn't narrow it down so much because he was the most prolific JNT era script editor. Uh, well, we'll have to go. Was it Peter Davison? Three for three. You oh. may destroy Conrad's record. Uh, it was a Peter Davison. St that, that narrows you down now to two and a half years not counting the Anthony Root material. You have two and a half years of Peter Davison, and you are very close. You are very close. Uh, was Turlow in it? Yes, Turlow was in it. And I want to point out to my audience, Dale is four for four. He has gotten every question right. I want to assure you that there has been no rigging of the game. I did not whisper in his ear, Psh! I did not tell him which story it was. He is on his own, crushing it, four for four. Now, he has a shot if he picks one Turlow story of breaking Conrad's record. If he wants to be more methodical, he might be able to tie it. But we could be looking at Doctor Who literature history on this Saturday morning. I'll have to go for the shot of making history, won't I? Was it Mordrin? Oh, I'm sorry. You have finally missed a question. It is not Maudrin Undead. You could still tie Conrad, which is a tremendous achievement in and of itself. There is, I think, mathematically no way you can fail the game now because you have 15 questions left, and I think there are fewer than 15 Turlow stories excluding Maudrin. So you're good. The question is, how good do you want to be? <laughs> I want to be better than I am every time. Uh, well, if there's a chance I can equal the record, I should go for that, I think, shouldn't I? Was it Planet of Fire? It is not Planet of Fire. So Conrad's record is safe for another week, but you could still get it in under 10, which is a remarkably good showing. Was there a returning villain in it? No, there was not a returning villain. Question eight we're up to. I mean, now I... For clarification, does the Black Guardian popping up briefly in the, uh, in the three stories, does that count as a returning villain for you? Uh, this is not a question question. This is a rules question, yes. The Black Guardian is a returning villain. Okay. Uh, ooh, that is tricky. I am going to go Frontios because I love Frontios. And Dale, you have got it in eight. It ah. is Frontios. It's not just a Turlow story. It is a Turlow story in which Mark Strixon is incredible and doesn't get enough credit for the work he did as a third as a third wheel character on the show so frontios is one of his best hours and it's a story that i love so when you say is it an eric sayward story is it a good story i love frontios and i came around that opinion the long way uh, i'll come to that eventually on this show when the frontios novelization comes up but i i recommend it highly yes me too the uh one of the things i did in between sending off the submission for heritage and them coming back and saying, yes, please write it, was I found every Doctor Who charity short story collection that was looking for people, and I wrote short stories for them, because in my head that would mean people might see it and go, oh, yeah, he'll be all right, we'll do that. And one of them was for a collection called Mrs. P Missing Pieces, where they wanted stories that filled in gaps in the history of Doctor Who, 
and the gap I chose was what was Chameleon doing in front of us. So I always love that story. It's ace. <laughs> because he presumably would have been scattered to the four winds underground and may have been damaged and then is brought back into the TARDIS when the Gravis reassembles things. So I will have to track that down. But for now, I'm going to reload the randomizer and my next victim will have to contend with a randomly selected story that I will select now. And let's press the choose a story button. Ah, that goes off in a very different direction. From Frontios, I pity my <laughs> next guest. Dale, you've been a good sport today. You have listened to me tell you what your book is about. You have uh, listened to me torture you with 20 questions. Um, I have talked quite a bit about Dale Smith Online, which is – again, you could spend hours on that site just looking at all of your material and all of your essays and all of the reviews, including – the person who butchered my review of, of Heritage. I'm still annoyed about that. Where else can we find you online? Sadly, not really anywhere. Um, I left Twitter and Facebook a while ago, so my contact ability is pretty much only through the, the website. There is a contact me on there if you need me for anything, but that is pretty much me online now. Well, I know for a fact that we are going to have you back on Doctor Who Literature in the coming months. I will not say which which story, but I'm looking forward to having you on again. Dale, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for listening to the show, and I look forward to doing this again real soon now. Same here. Thanks very much. Doctor Who and the Hand of Fear, written by Terence Dix, televised as the Hand of Fear, teleplayed by Bob Baker and Dave Martin, televised in October 1976, published in January 1979. The TARDIS lands in England, and Sarah, the Doctor's companion, looks forward to going home. A freak accident and a quarry leaves the unconscious Sarah clutching an enormous stone hand. The Hand is the only surviving remnant of Eldrad, an alien superbeing expelled from his planet, Castria, and it has the power to control the human mind. Using Sarah as its instrument, the Hand goes in search of the atomic energy it needs to regenerate Eldrad's body. Eldrad is determined to return to Castria and punish his enemies. The Doctor and Sarah are caught up in the terrifying conclusion of a drama of betrayal and revenge that began millions of years ago. As a kid, The Hand of Fear was not one of my favorite TV stories. It's hard to pinpoint why. Watching it again in college in the mid-1990s after having completed some film studies, I was dazzled by Lenny Main's almost expressionist direction, with lots of long, silent montages telling the story. After my classic series pilgrimage, I am fully in awe of the story. The first four-minute sequence set on Castria is as long as we've gone in the Tom Baker era so far without seeing a recognizable human. This is very reminiscent of Superman the movie, which was still two years in the future. The business beneath the dome on the frozen Castrian surface, with all characters fixated on a space capsule heading towards Earth as their civilization collapses and technicians die in place at their workstations, is so Krypton that it's almost a surprise to the modern viewer that Marlon Brando doesn't show up, or William Russell for that matter. Those four minutes are striking. They are not designed to appeal to 12-year-old Jason watching on PBS in April or May of 1975, but they appeal to this 40-year-old, well, 40-plus, well, almost 50. And those four minutes are not a patch on the novelization. Terence's three-page prologue is a wonderful bit of language and restructuring. We go inside Eldred's detonation capsule and see his right hand with its jeweled ring clenching and unclenching, which helps, which helps explain why the hand has a life of its own on TV, because the king of nothing's willpower is propelling it from millions of years ago. We also build up to Rokon's reading out of Eldrad's death warrant, which are the first spoken words on TV, and Terence retypes them in print as a poem. There's also a clue, which we don't find out on TV for a while longer, 
that castrians are not your garden variety carbon-based life form. Zaska, a bit part that barely registers on TV, is said in the book to have a, quote, strangely constituted body. Well, here's a better idea. Let's get Fraser Gregory, the man with the golden voice, to just read out that whole prologue for us. Take it away, Fraser. The planet was dying. On the surface of Castria, nothing moved, nothing lived. Lashed by constant snowstorms, scoured by solar winds, Castria was bleak, deserted, dead. It was very cold in the observation dome. A sinister-looking figure wrapped in his thick hooded cloak, Zazka sat shivering at the control console, studying the monitor screen. A tiny blip of light moved across it with infinite slowness as the capsule it represented hurtled through deep space. A voice crackled from the console speaker. Central Command to Zone 6! Central Command to Zone 6! Report immediately! Obliteration module on course and at normal function. Dome temperature continues to fall. You are not Technician Oban. Zazga glanced at a huddled shape in the corner. Technician Oban no longer functional. He has died from the cold. This is Commander Zazka. Computer time for capsule detonation. The capsule has been projected through the space warp. It will reach a distant solar system in six time units. Power levels are falling rapidly. Contact may soon be lost. Report on barrier condition. Deteriorating steadily. There was a pause. The voice said, The north has already fallen. When the south barrier collapses, temperature loss will intensify rapidly. Surface operation will no longer be possible, said Zaska flatly. His strangely constituted body had immense resilience, but he knew that if he remained on the surface of the planet for much longer, he would die like all the others. There was another pause, then the voice spoke again. Confirmed. Here are new orders. Switch capsule control through to me, here at central command. I shall detonate the module now, before contact is lost. But King Rokon, total obliteration of Eldrad was ordered. Computer indicates premature detonation would give a 1 in 3 million chance of particle survival. We have no choice. Switch control to me now, then evacuate the observation dome. I obey, your majesty. Zaska's hands moved stiffly over the controls. High above a primitive planet, the Castrian obliteration capsule sped through space like some wandering meteor. Inside, its occupant lay stretched out like a corpse in a coffin. But he wasn't dead. Not yet. He lay clamped in unbreakable bonds, listening to the voice in his ear. The prisoner knew that when the voice ended, his life would end with it. He lay motionless, listening. Only his right hand, with its great jewelled ring, clenched and unclenched convulsively. The voice was that of King Rokon, the one who had condemned him to this fate. It was old and full of malicious satisfaction. Eldrad, slayer of the Vox Libra, said the voice in a kind of chant. Eldrad, transgressor of the order. Eldrad, carrier of all evil. Eldrad, destroyer of the barriers. Eldrad, saboteur, genocide, anarch, far away on Castria. The wizened hand reached for the control that would trigger the capsule's self-destruct mechanism. Eldrad, sentenced to obliteration. The finger stabbed down. In the few seconds of life that remained to him, one thought filled the prisoner's mind. No! Eldrad must live! Eldrad must live! As the capsule disappeared in a soundless explosion, his massive body shattered into a thousand fragments. Yet, due to some freak of the blast, one part of him still survived. The right hand was flung free of the explosion. Down, 
down it spun until at last it buried itself deep into the primeval mud of the planet below. There it stayed for 150 million years. Well, between Fraser and Conrad and their guest readings, I'm going to get put out of business. The rest of part one on TV is made up of ordinary humans, or castrians, doing their day jobs, barely having time to accommodate the fact that Doctor Who is blundering about their affairs. Zaska has a job to do, as his civilization fails, and still makes time to remove the corpse of a frozen colleague before he, too, perishes. Abbott, the young quarry foreman, makes sure to disclaim any liability for Sarah's accident, then gets back to work once the doctor, who searched for Sarah he's been helping, starts nattering on about plastic and ceramic spaceships. The hospital intern thinks this is his TV show, giving his patient, our doctor, a lecture about pain, and comically shaking the doctor's hand once he learns that he's a brother medic. Dr. Carter, in his mustard yellow shirt, in case you couldn't tell, it's 1976, simply wants to work in his lab and eat his lunch. The Doctor is not the main character in this script, so we see him mostly as others do, weird and off-putting. Terence finds that TV ethos and applies it to his written descriptions of the quarry workers, who are about to inadvertently blow up the Doctor and Sarah Jane in Chapter 1. Page 13. The burly man's name was Tom Abbott, and he was foreman of the quarry's blasting crew. His safety record had been unblemished for 20 years, and he didn't intend to have it ruined now. He turned and ran back along the cliff edge. Over by the gate, he could say Mike, his explosives engineer, crouched over his detonating equipment. Abbott waved his arms frantically, scissoring them above his head in a cutting gesture. Mike nodded cheerfully and reached for the handle of his detonator. The rest of Chapter 1 is short for Terence, just seven pages, but that's because Terence ended the prologue with Eldrad's hand falling to Earth, so Chapter 1, dramaturgically speaking, has to end with the rediscovery of that hand. The Chapter 1 dialogue is also quite different to what was heard on TV, again almost certainly a case of Terence novelizing the camera scripts, which didn't reflect all the improvising that happens on location, which is where all of Chapter 1 takes place, in the Gloucestershire Quarry. Chapter 2 is called The Ring of Power. You'd have to think that was a conscious Tolkien illusion. We're still in January 1979, more than 40 years away from the Amazon-produced Lord of the Rings series of a similar name, but Tolkien was already deeply part of the cultural zeitgeist. On page 18, Terence uses identical language from the prologue to call back to Eldred's hand, as Sarah's own hand, quote, clenched and unclenched convulsively. However, the Doctor uses the word paralepsis, in the book, which, as far as I can tell, and my day job involves some exposure to medical terminology, isn't a real word. It's paralysis on TV. On page 21, Terence injects some of his own trademark dry wit, describing Dr. Carter as, quote, a harassed-looking man with untidy gray hair, which is literally all you need to know about the character, and TV's Rex Robinson springs to life in your head, perfectly formed. As I continue on with this project, I grow more interested in the science of how Terence ended his chapters. Not just where he placed episode cliffhangers, but what, what, but, but what moments of action or tension he used to close out every chapter. If chapter 1 ends with the return of Eldrad's hand, chapter 2 ends with Sarah hearing the word Eldrad in her head, perfectly structured to build up to the big part 1 cliffhanger reveal. Terence does some rescue work in the first scene of chapter 3. He uses the doctor's unit credentials to exert authority at the quarry, and also explains that the TARDIS is moved to a safer location within the quarry. The unit era officially ended with the Seeds of Doom, one season and two TV stories earlier, but Terence and Unit go way back, so he has no qualms about bringing them up, even in a book coming out in 1979. He does not, however, include the Andy Pandy reference, mention only that Sarah was wearing a striped overall dress. Terence gets to use some dramatic license in describing the nuclear power plant grounds in a pretty amazing way, though. Pages 30 and 31, quote, Sarah was passing through a metal forest of gleaming coolant towers and domed reactor housings. High above her, walkways and gantries stretched in every direction, like the streets of some futuristic city. Dr. Carter gets a bit of extra characterization as a vintage car enthusiast who drives a Bentley 
and drives like an amateur racing driver. Now, I'm no car expert. I'm a mass transit guy, and I'm a subway enthusiast living in a major population center. But that boxy lime green thing that's used as Dr. Carter's vehicle on TV is almost certainly not a vintage Bentley capable of, quote, speeding along the road with a satisfying roar. Terrence does a good job with the final four pages of Chapter 3, making up the Part 1 cliffhanger. The scenes are told in short bursts, with some original turns of phrase, like a radiation-suited guard looking like, quote, some alien astronaut. This is a little match for Lenny Maine's direction on TV, though. Maine directed this thing with a vibrancy and wit. Hardly a word is spoken in the last six minutes of Part 1, and Maine had the benefit of filming the power plant on location with unusual angles, not to mention all the wide-angle shots of Sarah as she zaps the security guards around the power plant's grounds. The two best nuclear meltdown movies I've seen, The China Syndrome, 1979 Hollywood, and Pandora, 2016 South Korea, are still a long way from being made, as Maine shot this, but Bob Baker and Dave Martin evidently can see the future. One odd feature of The Hand of Fear on TV is that it's almost, in a sense, four separate one-part adventures stitched together. Eldrad appears in a different incarnation in each part, a fossil, a living hand, a female humanoid, and a male humanoid. Most of the human guest cast appears for just one episode each. The principal guest star, so to speak, is Glenn Houston's Professor Watson. Terence must have understood that it's hard to keep much narrative momentum in a book where characters come and go at will, so he seizes on Watson as the audience identification figure. And boy, does that work! Here's how Watson is introduced, page 34. Professor Owen Watson, director of the research complex, was a burly, tough-looking, irascible man whose appearance suggested the rugby field rather than the laboratory. At the moment, he was standing by the central computer in the middle of the main control room, glaring about him like an angry bull about to charge. And Watson's first few lines of dialogue are printed in all capital letters. This is a man on the printed page who is going to make his presence known. Terence also effortlessly introduces the dangers of nuclear meltdown. And this was a book that was released two months before the China Syndrome came out on American theaters then three months or so before the nuclear incident at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania. Page 37. All over the complex, grave-faced men listened to Professor Watson's voice in a stunned silence. They were used to working with the remote possibility of atomic explosion, but so elaborate were the safety measures, so automatic the protective routines, that the thought of any real danger had long been pushed to the back of their minds. The complex as a whole contained not one, but a whole series of nuclear reactors. If one of them should blow and set off a chain reaction... You would think that was a passage from Burton Wohl's novelization of the China Syndrome, rather than the novelization of a 1976 British TV serial. The Chapter 4 cliffhanger is another book-only moment, an invented bit of tension and drama to escalate the stakes, and to end the chapter in a way that refuses to let you put the book down that makes you, whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Dr. Carter has already come under the influence of Eldrad at this point on TV, but Terence has that moment occur slightly later in the text and calls dramatic attention to it. Page 42. Dr. Carter was standing at the back of the little crowd. Sarah's eyes seemed to be staring from the screen straight into his own. For some reason, he remembered the smooth, warm feeling of the stone hand when he'd held it to prepare the slide. Suddenly, Sarah's words seemed to contain some great truth, something he'd always known but had now realized for the first time. A voice spoke inside Carter's head. Eldrad must live! Eldrad must live, whispered Carter. He started edging closer to the doctor. Chapter 5 is one of those vintage late 70s era Terrence chapters made up of several single paragraph sections such that half the chapter by column inch is made up of the blank spaces between the sections. But this is another great chapter for the characterization of Professor Watson. As the reactor nears meltdown, Terence writes that his voice is, quote, curiously calm for such a bad-tempered man. And he's, he decides to call his wife and children one last time. The top three paragraphs on page 48 may honestly be some of the best paragraphs Terence ever wrote and the Doctor and Sarah Jane aren't even in them. 
Now, I've already burned up my Fraser Gregory voiceover allotment for this week, so please forgive me as I try to do it myself. Professor Watson's little daughter had answered the phone. Delighted to find her father on the line, she began a long, rambling account of some school triumph. For a moment, Watson felt like yelling at her to get off the line. Then he thought it would be a pity if his daughter's last memory was of him shouting at her. He forced himself to listen patiently, then said, That's very good, Susie. I'm sure your teacher was pleased. Be a good girl and get mum for me, will you? I'm in a bit of, I'm a bit short of time. Quickly now. When his wife came on the line, Watson found himself quite incapable of telling her that he would probably be dead in a few minutes' time. Let her be happy for a while longer. She'd hear soon enough. Instead, he said cheerfully, Hello, love, it's me. I'm afraid I've got to stay a bit later than usual tonight. There's a bit of a crisis. Just thought I'd let you know where I was. Yes, I'll see you later then. Bye, love. He put down the phone. The dials for Sector 4 had moved into the final, unlabeled black sector. He remembered an old technician's joke. When you see the dial in the black, you're already dead. But not only that, Chapter 5 also sees Driscoll get a lot more lines than he got on TV, reallocated from Miss Jackson, who delivered them in his place, and the Doctor gets a rare moment of self-doubt on page 49, a pre-Legopolis fear of heights, while climbing to the very top of the big cooling tower. He has the plant, but Sarah has the power. I'm so sorry. This bears a little resemblance to what happened on TV, but the first two pages of Chapter 6, the Doctor's vertiginous battle with the possessed Dr. Carter, and then his dramatic leap into the cooling duct, are far superior to even Lenny Main's stylish direction. I won't read the full content, but the Doctor thinks of a sad eulogy for Carter, but he had his problems of his own. Terence describes Carter's long fall to the ground below, and the, quote, distant thud, and he describes the doctor flying through space as he leaps into the scorching cooling duct to rescue Sarah. This material takes up just 38 seconds on TV, and rather than taking place on narrow ladders and flimsy catwalks, takes place on more substantial staircases and factory floors. There is no flying leap, either. Granted, it would be near impossible to film on location what Terence wrote in the book, but the novelization passages are so good that it's hardly fair to criticize the TV production. The prose, too, especially in Chapter 6, belies the oft-leveled complaint that Terence wrote mere transcripts of the camera scripts. We get all-timers like the doctor shot out of the cooling duct like the Demon King in a pantomime, and Professor Watson, quote, going up with his reactor like a captain going down with his ship. The doctor coughs, by way of distraction, when Sarah notices that her chin hurts because the doctor had punched her in the reactor room while she was still possessed. Chapter 7 is entitled Blow Up, and I wouldn't know if Terence was a fan of Antonioni films, and there are no mimes in this chapter, but it would seem to be a conscious illusion. This chapter is a bit rushed, again mostly made up of the blank spaces between short single paragraph sections, and Sarah Jane loses her not-as-armless-as-it-looks pun. Sarah also trolls the Doctor with a post-hypnosis Eldred must live on TV, whereas in the book, Presumably drawn from the original drafts before Tom and Liz put their ad-libs to work, Sarah no longer recognizes the name Eldred. On page 73, Dr. Carter's vintage Bentley, or boxy lime green sedan, having been left abandoned when its owner plunged to his death under alien mind control, we learn that Professor Watson drives a Jaguar, or is it Jaguar, saloon. Now, this podcast is dedicated to reading the target novelizations in publication order, what I have not done is read every book ever written in publication order, but I'll bet you a stick of rock that this is probably the last published book in chronological order to ever refer to a car as a saloon. On TV, I don't need to tell you, Watson was merely accompanied by a drab green Jeep, which may well be the same one previously seen in part one of Robot, though I'm no expert on Doctor Who 1970s production office motor vehicle hires. Chapter 8 is another example of how Terence is working from a draft script, missing the genius-level input of Tom and Liz. On TV, Tom says outward and inward, while moving his hands in the opposite direction. That's always funny. King George did it in Hamilton, singing Oceans Rise, Empires Fall, with the opposite notes. And no, I'm not going to sing that. This bit of hand business is not in the book, of course, 
and Tom and Liz exchange heartfelt I worry about yous, both of which are missing in the corresponding book scene. So let's give a listen to the television. I worry about you. No, anyway, who found that thing? You did. Right. So, I'm involved. It could have been me, not Driscoll. And besides, I'm from Earth and you're not. That's true. Exactly. Yes, but... Ah, oh, but what? I worry about you. So, be careful. We'll both be careful. And if you thought it was difficult emotionally to hear that, it's only going to get worse. It's a sad fact about the writing of The Hand of Fear that the production overstays Glenn Houston's welcome. He's terrific in Part 2. His character, as written in Part 3, is about as dumb a supporting character as Doctor Who sees in the classic years. First, he tries to nuke Eldrad, a character that uses radiation to regenerate by tossing more radiation at it. When that doesn't work, and Eldred regenerates into Judith Paris, Watson pulls out a gun. Nuclear missiles didn't work, so gee, let's pull out a 45 instead. Terence rolls with this less than felicitous bit of plotting, and explains why and how Watson has the gun, and lovingly details on page 80 the quote, half an hour's training on its use. That's funny and Terence does give Watson a better exit, a longer conversation with the ministry on the phone, and the parting phrase, greatly cheered by this exchange, Professor Watson slammed down the phone and turned to his assistant. The female Eldrad is introduced, by the way, at the top of chapter 9, through Sarah's eyes, with the phrase, and I quote, a case of aliens lib. Ugh, oy vey, Terence. Terence closes out Chapter 9 with a nether knot on TV scene, bringing Bat Abbott, the quarry foreman from Part 1, for one last bewildered look at the Doctor's vanishing TARDIS, which is cute, a good addition to the book, even if not necessary on screen, especially as it would have involved paying the actor for another episode's work. On TV, the Doctor gives out an actual phone number to Eldrad as part of Castria's space-time coordinates, the novelization's numbers on pages 90 and 91, interestingly, are almost identical to what Tom spouted on TV. Did you know that Part 4 features Doctor Who's first transgender regeneration? The Castrians are 150 million years old. They've heard of the Time Lords, and they have regenerative technology. And Eldrad regenerates from the shapely female Judith Paris into the reliably boxy male Stephen Thorne. Where was fandom up in arms over this in 1976? Where was the R.I.P. Doctor Who crowd? Or one person. What? You say they didn't care? What? Sarah in Chapter 11 gets a good internal moment, trying to puzzle out why the Doctor is going to so much trouble to save a now-poisoned Eldrad's life. Which probably speaks for Terence, who is a little confused by the plot at this point, I'd imagine, with there being no obvious reason for the Doctor to try to save Eldred at this point in the narrative. Page 97. For a fleeting moment, Sarah wondered why they were going to so much trouble and risk to save the life of someone they had no great reason to like or trust. Why didn't they just leave her and return to Earth? It was a kind of natural reflex, she decided. When someone was badly hurt, it seemed natural to do your best for them, whoever or whatever they were. Part 4 is not the most interesting material on television, at least until Sarah's farewell sequence, but Terence adds a wrinkle on page 107, chapter 12, where the Doctor tricks Sarah into crossing the abyss on a narrow bridge. All this material, tricks and traps in the labyrinth, might seem stronger if I hadn't recently covered almost identical scenes in the novelization of Death to the Daleks, episode 43, and The Keys of Marinus, a forthcoming episode which has already been recorded. I do like a slight scene placement switch. Don't know if this is Terence's invention or a vestige of working from an older draft, but in the book, the computer announces that Eldrad's regeneration will proceed after we've seen Judith Paris's costume destroyed, rather than before, which gives more attention to the material in the book than on TV. The rest of the Eldrad material after Eldrad becomes Stephen Thorne, is pretty rote. Terence flies through it in a hurry. Chapter 13 succeeds mostly if you just listen for Thorne's voice in your head. 
But Terence does have the doctor think of a good response to the regenerated Eldrad's villainous ranting. Quote, same old dictator's rant, thought the doctor wearily. How often he had, had he heard it before? But this new Eldrad was powerful and dangerous. He had to be stopped. End quote. And a few pages later, quote, Eldrad seemed to have a limitless capacity for producing one mad scheme after another. I fancy I know my Terence by now, and I'm pretty sure that last line is a dig at the script. But of course, in the hands of voice actors like Thorne and Roy Skelton, the part four material is so cheesy, so cornball, that I can't help but love it anyway. And we'll need those laughs in a few minutes' time, so let's take another short break and listen up some television. Nothing. What stupidity is this? After the premature detonation of the module, we knew there was a remote possibility that one day you would return. Yes, I'm here! But let me tell you, after you destroyed the barriers, after we knew for certain that life on the surface was finished, and the alternative was a miserable subterranean existence, the Castrian race chose final oblivion. And because they feared you might return to wage eternal war throughout the galaxy, they elected also to destroy the race band. Traitor! I gave their life! So now you are king, as was your wish. I salute you from the dead. Hail, Eldred! King of nothing. Is this my reward? I created this world! It is mine! Mine by right! Chapter 14 is called Sarah's Farewell. As if she had any choice in the matter. That's going to be emotionally rough, so let's talk about something else for a moment. There's more dialogue in the book, following Eldrad's plunge to his presumed doom. Sarah asks to keep Eldrad's ring as a souvenir, and the doctor says it's too dangerous for her, so tosses it down into the abyss. Then the doctor feigns injury a second time to trick Sarah across the abyss, which again, doesn't happen on page TV. <sighs> okay, deep breaths everybody. Page 123. Sarah clenched her teeth. There were times when she found the doctor absolutely maddening, and this was definitely one of them. Page 125. Sarah's anger faded, as she realized that the doctor meant what he was saying. She'd only been half serious in her threat to leave, and was quite expecting the doctor to talk her out of it, with the promise of a trip to some fabulous planet. Sarah's departure in all takes up six pages a fantastic amount of real estate for a 121-page target novel. And this is taken from transmission rather than the draft we know now from the season 14 Blu-ray, which has the original scripts as a BD-ROM extra, that Robert Holmes originally had a go at this scene and wrote a perfunctory and bloodless farewell that seems like it was auditioning to be one of those J&T-era non-exit exits. Thank goodness that Tom Baker and Liz Sladen got to work rewriting that scene, and that's the one Terence uses. Well, most of it. He did leave out some pretty heart-wrenching dialogue. But even with that, these six pages are the mother of all gut punches from an author who usually specializes in dry wit and irony. And hang on a minute. I've got something in my eye. I'm not crying. You're crying. <laughs> You're a good girl, Sarah. Oh, look, it's too late apologizing now. Everything's packed. I've got to go. How did you know? What? Well, I've had the call from Gallifrey. So? So I can't take you with me. You've got to go. Oh, come 
on. I can't miss Gallifrey. Look, I was only joking. I didn't mean it. Hey, you're not going to regenerate again, are you? Not this time. I don't know what's going to happen. You're playing one of your jokes on me, just trying to make me stay. No. I've received a call, and as a Time Lord, I must obey. Next time on Doctor Who Literature, uh, next time uh, next time we're uh, out of the Sarah Jane books. This was not only the novelization of her last story, but it's her last novelization full stop. We move on ahead to um, season 15 uh, on the Graham Williams era, and I, uh, I, I can't even. I gotta get out. Uh, join me and someone else next week to discuss some uh, non-Sarah Jane book. Oh, man, that one hurt. Thank you for joining me on another episode of the Doctor Who Literature Podcast. I'm Jason, your host and editor and producer. Special thanks to my special guest, Dale Smith. This podcast can be found on most of your podcast apps of choice. You can find all past episodes at anchor.fm slash Doctor Who Lit. It really helps if you rate five stars and subscribe. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Who Novels, that's DR Who Novels, and under the hashtag Doctor Who Pilgrimage, that's DR Who Pilgrimage, and on email at Doctor Who Literature, that's DR Who Literature at gmail.com. Please drop me a line with your comments, questions, and suggestions. Before I forget, thank you as well to Fraser Gregory for a phenomenal guest reading from the Hand of Fear novelization. Thank you all for listening, and whatever you do, keep turning the pages. Doctor Who Podcast Network.